Think of a city where nightfall never ends. The streets are packed so tightly that no sunlight can reach the narrow alleyways. Electric wires hang from the ceilings above and neon signs flicker at every doorway. In this city, more than 33,000 people live in cramped, self-built apartments that are barely 10 square meters. Meanwhile, massive airships thunder overhead. Does this sound like a scene from a futuristic dystopian novel? Actually, this description is of a very real place that existed within our lifetime. Kowloon Walled City, located on the outskirts of Hong Kong, was once renowned as the most densely populated place on earth. The city lacked any form of government supervision, being claimed by both China and Britain, yet ruled by neither. The city grew in response to the influx of destitute individuals who came there hoping to start fresh. Did Kowloon Wall City serve only as a massive slum or was it something greater? Perhaps it was a groundbreaking trial in communal living and architecture that defined convention. Today, we will venture into the dark alleyways of this everlasting night to explore the most dystopian city that has ever existed. Following China's crushing defeat in the First Opium War, the country was compelled to cede Hong Kong to the British in 1842. However, uh, the Hong Kong the British were granted in 1842 was not as large as the present day territory. Specifically, the region of Kowloon City lay just beyond the boundaries and it was in Kowloon where an ancient fort dating back to the Song Dynasty of 960 to 1279 AD was that would one day become the nucleus of the wall city. As the 19th century progressed, China suffered another loss in the Second Opium War and was compelled to cede more land to the British. By the time of the First Sino-Japanese War in 1895, China was incapable of maintaining control over its borders. This may explain why the British were able to impose yet another treaty on the Qing, effectively giving them authority over Kowloon. However, the British Empire faced a problem. Despite China's weakness, it was still a massive and geographically proximate country, while London was almost 10,000 kilometers away. If the Chinese were genuinely determined to retain control of a section of Kowloon, there was little the British could do about it. It turned out that China was extremely keen on retaining possession of the old Song Dynasty port. In the 1898 Second Convention of Peking, Beijing insisted on adding a clause that stated its ownership of the Kowloon port. The full text of the clause read, The Chinese officials now stationed there shall continue to exercise jurisdiction except so far as may be inconsistent with the military requirements for the defense of Hong Kong. Presumably, the British replied with a hearty agreement while covertly crossing their fingers and winking at each other. In May 1899, less than a year after the Second Convention of Peking was signed, British troops invaded Kowloon Port, ejected the Chinese officials and declared it a part of the British Empire. As they had anticipated, Beijing did not put up a fight. The line in the convention stating that the fort was owned by the Chinese had been revealed to be nothing more than ink on paper. However, words, despite being intangible, have a curious way of uh, influencing reality. After all, it was words inscribed on a document that had initially awarded Hong Kong to the British. It was also the Zimmerman Telegram's words that would draw the US into the First World War. Consequently, it wouldn't be long before the British would rue the day they granted Beijing such a formidable tool as those very words. The treatment of squatters in Kowloon Fort can serve as a marker of the changing fortunes of China and British throughout the 20th century. One such instance occurred in June 1933 when the Hong Kong regional government became uneasy with the presence of Chinese peasants residing in the fort's ruins. Consequently, they forcefully evicted them from their homes. Although the peasants lodged a complaint with Beijing, the latter was reluctant to engage in another conflict with the British given their previous losses in the Opium Wars. Fast forward two decades and the situation had drastically changed. By 1947, the British Empire was still recovering from the devastating effects of the Second World War while China was embroiled in a brutal civil war between the Communists and the Nationalists. 
As the conflict escalated and casualties mounted, thousands of refugees sought asylum across the border in Hong Kong, many of whom found their way to Kowloon Port. By 1948, about 2,000 destitute Chinese refugees were squatting in the port, prompting colonial police to attempt to evict them in January of that year. However, the operation turned into a violent confrontation when the refugees fought back with rocks, leaving six police officers injured and forcing the fort surrender to the refugees. Given the British Empire's imperial might, could they have retaken the fort if they really wanted to? Absolutely. After all, this was the same empire that had once conquered half the world. However, in 1948, the British Empire was not in the mood for conquest. The devastation of World War II had taken its toll on London and the recent partition of India had resulted in a brutal wave of ethnic cleansing. There was no desire to provoke further trouble in Hong Kong. Instead, the colonial authorities chose to withdraw and wait for a better opportunity. This opportunity would not come for several decades. It wasn't until October 1, 1949 that Chairman Mao and his communist forces emerged victorious in the Chinese Civil War. In the aftermath, thousands of non-socialists fled to Hong Kong with many seeking refuge in Kowloon. In 1950, the number of people living in the fort had increased significantly to 17,000 and the population was no longer just refugees. Criminals, dropouts, peasants, anarchists and those evading the law had all found their way to the eclectic community on the outskirts of Hong Kong. It was during this time that Kowloon Fort was transformed into Kowloon Wall City. A devastating fire broke out on January 11, 1950, destroying most of the makeshift town. Despite efforts by firefighters, only the ancient core was saved. Rather than relocating, the residents returned to the site and began to rebuild. Uh, they erected new homes on top of each other out of necessity, resulting in a new form of architecture that grew organically based on the needs of its inhabitants. These humble beginnings eventually led to the creation of the legendary Wall City. However, the British colonial authorities were not finished with their attempts to remove its inhabitants. In March 1962, for example, they announced their plans to demolish the Wall City within a year. Just like in 1933, the residents of the city voiced their complaints to Beijing. This time, Mao's government took action and declared the Wall City belonged to Communist China, citing the Second Convention of Peking, which the British had agreed to in the past. With the fear of war with China looming, the British agreed not to interfere in the Wall City but also did not allow Beijing to administer it. Thus, the Wall City existed in a legal grey area where neither China nor Britain had the power to enforce their laws. From this unique situation arose one of the most bizarre cities in history. This is how Kowloon Wall City came to be. Let us now enter the walled city and explore what it was like to live in such an environment. One of the most striking features was the extreme lack of space. Even after 1963, when the population had surpassed 17,000 people, the influx of new residents did not stop. This included refugees fleeing Mao's cultural revolution and Hong Kong citizens who had lost everything in the 1973 stock market crash. Despite the growing numbers, the physical size of the Kowloon Fort remained the same covering an area equivalent to four FIFA soccer pitches. The British authorities were not about to interfere inside the port, but they also weren't going to allow it to expand beyond its limits. This left the new arrivals with only one option for building homes, a During the 1980s, Kowloon Wall City had reached a maximum height of 14 stories, which posed a serious threat to planes landing at Hong Kong airport. The towers comprising the structure were not your typical apartment blocks. Although some residents had standard-sized living spaces, most of the buildings in the walled city consisted of numerous 30-meter square apartments that were stacked on top of each other. Some of the one-room apartments were even smaller, measuring less than the average American bedroom. Did you know that there were people keeping count? Despite the cramped living conditions, multiple families often shared these tiny apartments. In a space not much larger than a closet, three or four generations would live together. Children would do their homework in one corner, while their parents ran a business from the front of the apartment. 
The walled city had its own entrepreneurs who kept things running, with many families turning the front of their apartment into a shop. Larger businesses also existed, taking advantage of the lack of labor laws enforcement. For example, slaughterhouses, unlicensed dentists and factories were established within the city. Amidst the bustling activity of this densely populated area, workers would package food for distribution throughout Hong Kong. Reportedly, the wall city was responsible for producing 80% of all rice balls consumed in the region at some point. On the subject of food, the city was renowned for its snacks such as Shao Mai, excuse that pronunciation, that could be purchased for the equivalent of a single US cent. If you weren't indulging in these treats, you could always visit one of the many noodle bars in the area where the noodles were so delicious, even those not interested in criminal activity would go there for the gastronomic experience. While the city was a hotbed of crime, it wasn't a perfect haven either, despite being different from its depictions in popular culture. Let's meet the individuals who were in charge of the wall city's organization since no country could exert its control over the city. One may wonder how it didn't become a permanent state of chaos. However, there were people who maintained order in their own way and it wasn't the police, it was the triads. Although the triads are commonly associated with violence in western culture, their role in the wall city was distinct. Since no one else was fulfilling the role, the triads essentially become the governing body of the wall city. They oversaw tasks such as waste management, recruited and managed a volunteer fire department, maintained order in the tight corridors and provided financial assistance to elderly citizens. In fact, one of the blocks even had an elderly care centre established by the triads for those in need of care. However, despite fulfilling some social functions, criminal activity still persisted within the triads. The drugs trade was the most destructive aspect and drug use was rampant in the walled city. Opium dens thrived in its darkest corners while a widespread heroin trade allowed residents to get high in the comfort of their tiny homes. There was even a hierarchy of drug users with the wealthier indulging in opium and the less well-off turning to heroin. The poorest of all could afford little red pills containing opioids which could help them forget their troubles even if only for an hour, for the equivalent of 3 US cents. As a result, addiction was rampant and there were reports of addicts dying in their apartments and not being found for months, as well as families hiding corpses to avoid paying funeral costs. Nonetheless, despite the darkness, there was also a lighter side of life in the wall city. The wall city, unlike its portrayal in movies, had a fully functioning society with schools, kindergartens and libraries. Additionally, there were two temples available for worship, one located in the darkness of the lower floors and the other under a skylight often covered in garbage. While the jobs were typical, they had their unique challenges. For instance, there were only two male carriers who spent eight hours a day navigating the labyrinthine alleys and the preposterous numbering system while squeezing through the narrow 90 centimeter wide passages. As the city grew without central planning, it was not like walking through a typical city block. One resident in the early 1980s attempted to create a map of the wall city, a task that took almost six years to complete due to the confusing layout of the corridors and hidden passageways that only the mail carriers had been able to navigate. However, beneath the outward chaos, life in the city followed a normal routine. On the rooftops, children played soccer and elderly men sunbathed, seemingly unaware of the airplanes overhead. Despite its similarities to a typical Manhattan block, the population density of the walled city was vastly different, with Manhattan's density being 27,000 people per square kilometer, while if the walled city were to be scaled up to that size, the density would reach 1.2 million people per square kilometer making it an unsuitable environment for anyone who suffers from claustrophobia. However, before this transfer of power, there were a lot of issues that needed to be resolved, including what to do with the walled city. While the walled city had existed in a legal grey area, it was clear that it would not be compatible with the Chinese system of governance. Thus, the decision was made to demolish the city and clear the land. The government offered compensation to the residents and after some negotiations, most agreed to leave. 
On April 24, 1990, the demolition began and within months, the walled city was completely gone. Today, the site has been replaced by a park and it's hard to imagine that this once infamous place ever existed. In the late 1980s, Kowloon Wall City began to integrate into Hong Kong society with colonial police even patrolling inside to ensure safety without enforcing British laws. However, as the city was starting to legitimize, the colonial authorities began plans to demolish it. This was a problem for Edward Yaoude, the colonial governor of Hong Kong, who saw the wall city as an embarrassing slum and a potential propaganda gift to China. He feared that if the city was handed over to China as is, Beijing would use it to humiliate the British crown. This led to the long process that would ultimately lead to the city's destruction. The residents were informed of the decision on January 14, 1987, when housing department staff and police sealed off all 83 exits and counted the inhabitants, which eventually totaled 28,200 people living in 8,800 buildings. Despite the news, the residents reacted with resignation rather than resistance. The phrase most frequently heard among the residents that day was, we'll see what Beijing has to say. However, when Beijing eventually spoke up, the residents received an unpleasant surprise. In early 1987, the Chinese government announced that they had no objection to the British demolishing the walled city. They were content to let the British do as they wished with the territory, and if that meant tearing it down, so be it. While the walled city was still under British rule, the Chinese government had used it as a way of reminding London that they still had power. But now that Hong Kong was back in Chinese hands, they no longer needed to send that message. In fact, they would rather see the walled city destroyed than deal with it themselves. As a result, the fate of the city was sealed and the colonial government spent the rest of the decade and early 1990s clearing the area. The residents were offered new homes and businesses received compensation packages during the clearance process. Some landlords even constructed new homes to claim extra money. By January 1991, almost all residents and more than half of the businesses had agreed to leave. However, Kowloon Wall City was known for its defiance of rules and the British authorities knew they would have to fight to tear it down. In 1991, there were warning signs of discontent with the destruction of the wall city. Union jacks were burned and protesters waved Chinese flags. Despite some tension, the situation remained calm until late fall when protests erupted outside Hong Kong's government house. Former residents marched through the streets and established a new tent city near Kowloon. In 1992, there were a number of clashes at the wall city, with the police being pelted with rocks and even punched by some residents. Given the tent situation, the authorities opted to overlook these incidents. However, in March of that year, a small improvised explosive device destroyed an abandoned flat, causing injuries. Following these incidents, the colonial authorities realized it was time to take decisive action and complete the clearance of the wall city. In June of that year, armed riot police converged on the wall city and headed towards the remaining apartments where the last stubborn residents were holding out. There were tense standoffs, heated arguments and the threat of violence. However, things did not spiral out of control for some unknown reason. One by one, the remaining residents surrendered to the police with their hands up. Finally, on July 1, 1992, the police reached the last apartment where the middle-aged couple had barricaded themselves. By 4.30 p.m. that day, the couple agreed to leave their apartment and stepped out into the bright sunshine, making them the final inhabitants of the walled city. Despite this, the clearance was not quite over yet. In mid-1992, the tent city that had been set up by protesters became a gathering spot for former residents of the Wall City, and it was growing in size. Worried that another Wall City might emerge, the authorities acted quickly to disassemble the encampment, which was done on July the 2nd. Demolition of the Wall City did not begin until eight months later in March of 1993. The process was slow and used tools rather than explosives. Even as the walls of the city fell to the wrecking wall, it was still possible to see its outlines for some time. By April of 1994, the last remains of the wall city had been eradicated. When Hong Kong authorities destroyed the city, they were acting with good intentions, as at the time it was considered nothing more than a slum, similar to Rio's favelas in its vertical nature. Mm -hmm.
right? Just like the favelas of Brazil, Kowloon Wall City was often misunderstood from an outsider's perspective. It was a community that spontaneously emerged without any government intervention. The city's unique architecture was designed by its inhabitants and over time it had evolved into a dystopian example of a Blade Runner style future. But more than that, it had become a distinctive community. It's worth noting that when the South China Morning Post interviewed a former resident who had received generous compensation to leave, he said, if given a choice, I would still run my air conditioner repair business at my Wall City shop and lead a content and secure life. Many other former residents have expressed similar feelings, reminiscing about the food, the people, and the sense of living beyond society's usual constraints. It appears that this sense of attachment to the Wall City has extended beyond its former residents. The Wall City of Kowloon is a place that continues to hold a place in people's hearts even today. This can be observed in the various forms of pop culture, such as the Narrows neighborhood in Gotham City, which was reportedly inspired by the Wall City, according to Batman Begins director Christopher Nolan. Additionally, in games like Call of Duty, Black Ops, the Wall City has been recreated as a playable level. In Japan, an amusement park has even been created, replicating three stories of the Wall City with authentic trash imported from the Kowloon area of Hong Kong. Thus, despite being a notorious slum that existed due to a diplomatic void, the Wall City has made a significant impact on history and continues to inspire people's imagination through sci-fi, graphic novels and visionary architecture. It remains to be seen if such a unique and self-organizing community will ever emerge again in the future. So, I hope that you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. If you know about a scam that we should have covered but missed out, or you think that there was something that the people should really know about, please leave it in the comments. Oh, and do not forget to smash the like and the comment, and you know all the buttons that people smash. Thank you today for watching.